Well done. Well, how's everybody doing this morning? You guys good? Awesome. Well, like Eric said, we're in this series where we're looking at church history. And uh, sometimes we have this tendency to look at the generations that have come before us. And again, this is, every generation does this. You think the people ahead of you, they're all stupid. And uh, if only they were smart and as enlightened as you are, then, you know, these old people wouldn't have screwed up the world that we're living in. And then you look at the generation behind you and you're like, they're so immature and we have so much wisdom that we could pass on to them if they would only ask us or if they would only take our example. There's always just this, this tension. And so we're trying to push back against that because they're, the goal in following Jesus, it, like we don't, to follow Jesus doesn't mean that we just, we're in a race where we start out of the gate, out of the blocks, and the gun goes off when you become a follower of Jesus, and you're just starting a race. It's more like a baton is being passed to you for you to run the next leg of the race, and this race has been getting run for thousands of years. There have been people who have been faithfully pursuing Jesus, faithfully trying to follow. Now, they didn't do it perfectly. They made mistakes like every generation does, but there's a whole lot that we can learn as the baton's being passed to us. And so we don't want to just look at what's come before us and just discount it and discredit it and go, C.S. Lewis called that chronological snobbery, that we think that we have it all together and our generation is the smartest um, and, you know, no one else gets it. And uh, so we're looking at these generations through, throughout church history. We're doing a it's a drive-by. I mean, you're talking about thousands of years of church history, and we're trying to sum it up in a handful of minutes uh, each week, and then what can we learn from these different eras or for these different generations within, uh, within the church? I love what uh, Eugene Peterson says um, about this concept that we need to learn from the previous generations of church history. He said, we need an antidote to the amnesiac, one-generational world that we live in. A one-generational church is capable of generating energy but there are no roots. When the emotions wear off or difficulty arrives, it withers. Soon there is nothing to show for it. Without a cultivated memory, we live from hand to mouth on fad and novelty. Here's the deal. We don't want to be people who live on fad and novelty. We don't want to be people who are following Jesus and it's just whatever the trend happens to be today, whatever the church happens to be dabbling in today, that we just assume that that's the way it's always been or we assume that that's the best way for us to be doing things. We want to have a cultivated history, a cultivated shared history. Where we're looking back. We have a good memory of, of where we come from and what our spiritual roots are, what our heritage is. This is all throughout Scripture. This is why in the Old Testament, uh, the Jewish people, they always referred to God as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They were referencing their ancestors who followed God faithfully. Even though they were living thousands of years after Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they were rooting their faith in generations before them, saying, I'm not the first person to try to follow God faithfully. There have been a lot of people that have been doing this for a long, long time, and we want to learn in that way. So, so this morning, I want to talk about, we're going to talk about the Reformation. Um, so I'm going to do my best to set up kind of what was going on in church history. The, the, the Reformation happened in the 16th century, so um, the early 1500s is when that happened. Um, so let me, let me give you, we'll just, we'll kind of catch you up to, to where we've been. Are, are you guys, are you going to be able to hang with me this morning? Yeah. Okay, we're going we're gonna to go kind of fast here uh, on this part, all right? So um, the Roman Empire, if you remember when we first started, the early church, persecution broke out like crazy within the Roman Empire, which was the birthplace of the church. And so people were being imprisoned, they were being tortured, they were being blacklisted, marginalized, pushed to the edges. The church had no power. I mean, we had the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the greatest power that you can have, but no political power, no social clout, nothing. The church didn't have a leg to stand on. It had no money, it had nothing, right? Um, and so Rome for whatever reason, saw the church as a threat and began trying to stamp out the church and began to uh, kill Christians, began to imprison them, torture them, all these things to try to keep this movement from spreading. But what they didn't understand was uh, that they went after the leadership of the church because in their mind, in any kind of a movement, if you take out the leaders of that movement, then you take out the movement, right? But what they discovered with the church was that was not actually the case, that you could take out leaders, and that was most often who they martyred, that was most often who they imprisoned, who they tortured, um, who they persecuted. But what they found was that it wasn't the carriers, like they looked at it as like an infection, that Christianity was this infection that was infiltrating the Roman Empire, and they wanted to eradicate it, they wanted to get rid of it. And so they thought, if we take care of the leaders, that will take care of it. But what they didn't realize was that the actual carriers of the, the disease, of, uh, of the germ of Christianity, it was all the people, everybody. It wasn't just the leaders, it was the everyday 
women and men of the church. They were the ones that were carrying it, and so you could take out the leaders, but the church still continued to grow, and the gospel still continued to uh, expand. The church ended up, um, even though they tried to suppress it, it actually ended up growing more. We said that Tertullian, an early church leader, said that the, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. It caused the church to grow. Even though they killed people within the church, Everyone else still just took the grace of Jesus and they kept bringing it to the world around them over and over again, more passionately, with more conviction, with every bit of persecution that came. So the church spread like wildfire um, and was growing to the point where in, the, uh, in, in 300 AD, it became basically the state religion of Rome. And all of a sudden, this exponential growth starts happening, and, and the church grew even more to where more than half of the Roman Empire were professing Christians. Um, and then what happened was the empire collapsed. And when the empire collapsed, everything descended into chaos. And the only thing that was left standing was the church and was monasteries, basically, in all of Western Europe and in most of the Mediterranean Rim, um, most of uh, the Middle East. It was just the church that was left there. It was monasteries and it was churches that were providing stability for, um, for the world around them. What ended up happening was everybody looked at the church as this, this, um, this stabilizing force, and they started looking at the monks and the nuns that were in monasteries, and they started looking at the clergy, the leadership of the church, it shifted from where everyone was a carrier of the gospel. It shifted from where what caused the early church to grow. It shifted to now where there actually be, began to be this hierarchy. Now, there was always a hierarchy of leadership within the church, but there wasn't a hierarchy of responsibility. So there are leaders within, you need to hear that. There are leaders within the church. God's okay with hierarchy, but there's not a hierarchy of responsibility. So me being on the platform teaching here doesn't mean that I have more of a responsibility in the kingdom of God than you have responsibility in the kingdom of God. Because Jesus said to everybody that his mandate when he left was for us to go and to make disciples of all nations. And he didn't say, if you're a leader in the church, if you have the gift of teaching, if you have this particular gift, then you're going to make disciples of all nations. He said, no, it's across the board. It's a responsibility for all of us. Well, that began to shift during the Middle Ages, during, during the Dark Ages, when everything descended into chaos. And so the, the, the hierarchy of, of what people saw, what Christians saw, there was this, these are the three layers of the hierarchy. It was monks, clergy, and laity. So laity were people who didn't have a, a Christian vocation. So here's the highest level, that was monks, because monks pulled away from all of the world. They like cloistered away in these monasteries. They didn't have the temptations of all of the regular culture because they pulled away from all that stuff so they could focus on prayer, so they could focus on meditation, meditating on God's word, and there were good things that came from that. But people looked at that as like they were the they were the spiritual superstars, right? Because they were willing to give up everything. They were willing to, to, to go far away, to sacrifice in all these profound ways. So they were the greatest. Then, then next was clergy. And so you had people who were, they were the leadership within the church. The Apostle Paul says that they were gifted to equip the saints to do the ministry. So again, the onus is supposed to be on all of us to be doing the ministry, but you had clergy, leaders within the church who were, they're called to equip all of the people to do the work of the ministry. They were, they were second as far as like the hierarchy of, uh, of what you're bringing to the table. Um, and the reason for that was because they had one foot in, uh, in being totally devoted to Jesus, but they also, they weren't cloistered away in a monastery. They were, they were still in the world. They were still living kind of secular lives because they weren't pulled away from everything else. And then the, thir the third layer, which was most people, was laity. These were people who were not monks, and they weren't the clergy. They were just everyday people who were followers of Jesus, who lived normal lives, and they were considered to be in a lower tier of following Jesus because, because they lived regular lives. They had marriages and spouses that they needed to take care of. They spent their days caring for children or working manual labor jobs or doing things like that. And in that culture, it was viewed as a lower calling or a lower purpose. And so what you had was all this mentality where it's like, man, to be pulled away as a monk, that's the greatest thing that you could do spiritually. And then if you're not, you know, committed enough to do that, maybe you could have a vocational calling to be a member of the clergy. But then if you're like normal people, 95% of the population, you're in lady, it's like, sorry, you're just kind of like lower tier, second class citizen. It's like, it's cool that you're following Jesus, but you're probably not going to 
it's probably not, you're not probably going to make a big deal. It's really not that big of a deal that you're following Jesus, which is obviously we know this is a problem, but in the culture in that time, this is just the way that things began to shift. Now, the way that people looked at it, though, was they looked at monks and they thought, well, they're so blessed because of the way that they're living that the blessing of their disciplined life, of living out these rhythms of discipline following Jesus, that can actually be transferred to me. Like the goodness of the monks can actually become my goodness in some way. Um, And so people started actually going to monasteries and asking monks to pray for them, to intercede for them, basically going like, I can't live, like it's hopeless for me because I have to live in the world I got kids to raise, and I got a job to work, and I got to earn money, which is the majority of people, but in their minds, it was like, and Jesus can't really get to me in this kind of a situation, so I can't really fight sin. I can't be holy the way that you can be holy, and so would you pray for me, and I'll trust that your prayers are going to do a powerful work in me, and that somehow your grace and your holiness that you're receiving that will be like transferred to me, and then I can find holiness through you. I mean, do we see the problem with this? mentality, right? Um, And I would submit to you that the reason why, if you've been a follower of Jesus for any bit of time, the reason why you see the problem with this is because of the Reformation. It's because of what we're talking about this morning. We, We sort of listen to this and we're like, that's messed up. Like, why would you, why would you think that way? It's like, well, when you're immersed in that kind of a culture, you're not pulling out of it objectively and going, this is wrong, what we're doing here. You're just, this is the water that you're swimming in. It's the air that you're breathing, right? So this is the direction that everything uh, was moving. Um, it set this, this was already dysfunctional, but it set the stage for even more dysfunctional um, uh, movements. There were also cultural shifts that began to happen. So you had this hierarchical shift within the church, but then you have the culture that begins to change rapidly where in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, where everything was descending into chaos, the church was the only um, stability that was being brought. Well, when, uh, medieval, when, the medieval, when the medieval age started, so around the year 1000, right in there, 900, 1000, 1100, you started to, they came out, of, started beginning to come out of the Dark Ages. And so government started to get stronger people's education, their education levels began to rise. There began to be more economic prosperity. You had all kinds of people who were were beginning to become mobile again, sort of the way that they were during the Roman Empire, the height of the Roman Empire. You could travel, and so people started to become more uh, well-traveled. Literacy rates increased, so people were reading. They were understanding uh, deeper concepts. Uh, Europe was changing in, in massive ways. And you had political entities, both like nation states and even just cities that were their own um, governments. If you remember, we talked about the fact that the church and the Roman Empire got into bed together. Um, And everyone at first thought this was amazing because it was like, now the church isn't being persecuted, but there was a downside to that, that the church began to think of the empire as the church and the empire began to think of the church as the empire and they got too enmeshed, and you couldn't differentiate between the two. Well, what that, even though the Roman Empire fell apart, the church held on to that political kind of behavior, where the church, the leaders within the church thought that they were, they were running the show. They thought that they were actually in charge of, of nations, and they were in charge of states, and they were in charge of cities, rather than seeing the church as the people of God who we are called out and we're separate. We live in the world, but we are not of the world. And we might serve in local governments, but the church is not the government. That's not the way that things work. Rather than seeing it that way, they continued to operate where it was like the church was overseeing political nations and political states in a lot of ways. And uh, during this time, you had nations and you had cities and you had states who began to pull away from the church's leadership and go, we don't want you running as a church. We don't want you running the state. And so all of a sudden, the church started having less political authority um, in this this part of the world. Um, Again, like I said, their education was increasing. They began to be more urban, more prosperous. People began to move into cities. Um, And what ended up happening was you had people who, as their education was increasing, as they realized that the government or that the the church was trying to do something within the state that it shouldn't be doing or that it didn't need to do, they started looking at this model of monks and clergy and laity and going, something's wrong here. Like, something is off here because the church is speaking to monks and the church is speaking to clergy and professors, 
but they're not speaking to the normal person and what the average person following Jesus, it's like we don't even count. And people started going, There's, this doesn't seem like it's right. And so they started recognizing that there were deficiencies in the church and they started demanding that there would be a new model of a Christian life, one that was more relevant to life outside of just the church itself, like the building of the church and the services of the church, and that would be relevant outside of the monastery and what's relevant to my life as an ordinary person who's got laundry to do and who has kids to raise and who has a career to work out and financial issues to work through in all these ways. Many people throughout Europe became increasingly critical of the church's failures, and they were starting to become too obvious to overlook. Um, at the same time, you started to have um, abuses within the church, where the church, was, the, the church wasn't helping itself. You had, they felt out of touch to the rest of the world. The rest of the world was looking at them going, and I'm not talking people who weren't followers of Jesus, because the church, you got to hear me say this, the church is always going to feel out of touch to people who don't know Jesus. They're going to look at the way that we live our lives, if we're living our lives correctly, and they're going to go, this doesn't make sense, because the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom, and the world doesn't understand that. And so Jesus said, if you want to have life, you have to lay your life down and lose your life. If you want to be the greatest leader of all, you have to be the greatest servant of all. I mean, everything is upside down. You want to be blessed. You want to receive. You've got to give things away. Everything is opposite. So the world looks at Christianity and it's like, it doesn't make sense, right? And if we try to gain the approval of the world around us and do things in a way that will make sense to them, we water down and we dilute the purposes of God. We water down and we dilute the gospel. We water down and we, we dilute the power of the kingdom of God. But this wasn't non-Christians that were having issues with the church. It was, it was the people of God. They were looking at the church going, this doesn't make sense. It, the way that we're functioning doesn't make sense for life. And the church structure wasn't helping with that. Um, a lot of the uh, parish clergy, so the priests, they were like, living lives that didn't even closely resemble the gospel. They were living in ways that weren't even remotely Christian. They were called to live celibate lifestyles. We can debate that, whether or not, you know, you should be able to be married and all of those things. But the bottom line is they, they were not supposed to be doing that. They were, so since they couldn't get married, they just had concubines on the side, a little, little side piece over here, uh, you know, on their own. They just, they just did whatever they wanted. And again, people were scratching their heads going, this doesn't, this doesn't line up with the gospel that we're hearing about. Um, <clears throat> They charged fees for services to try to make money on the things that they were doing. Um, bishops and cardinals, so the, the higher levels of leadership, they started to just enjoy all the wealth and all the accolades and prestige of high office without actually having to perform their duties. The scholars, church scholars, were studying things that nobody cared about. They were digging into this like spiritual minutia, and everybody was like, this doesn't even make sense. What is the point in all of this? Uh, the popes were kind of the biggest issue. Um, the, the, the leadership over the church, they they were spending more time collecting art and building large cathedrals and basilicas and trying to raise money for those kinds of things than they were overseeing the issues of the church, um, the spiritual issues of the church. And people could sniff that out. They could, <clears throat> they could see that. And so people started calling for change. Everything was ripe for, for complete change within the church. Um, one of the things that was being done uh, was the, it was called, it's, they're called indulgences, the sale of indulgences. And um, so so what the idea was, there was, there was doctrine, the doctrine of purgatory. And purgatory was, it's not heaven and it's not hell. So you were good enough to avoid hell, but you weren't good enough to make it into heaven. So you're not bad enough to have to go to hell, but you're not good enough to go to heaven, so you would go to purgatory. And purgatory was a place where you would work out the sin that you did have in your life when you died. Again, this is faulty. Um, theology, but you would work out the sin that you did have when you died in order that you were prepared and holy so that you could get to heaven. Well, you didn't know how long you were going to be in purgatory, having to work things out, and so you were dependent on people here on earth praying for you. They would pray for you to be released from purgatory. They would pray for, for God to, to set you free and to bring you into heaven, and you were just at their, like, whatever they had going on, whatever, if they were praying for you a lot, then you might get out of purgatory quicker, and if, if they weren't praying for you, then you would be stuck there being tortured or in some kind of pain until you were good enough to get into heaven. And that's bad enough, okay? But then the church took that and was basically like, 
you know, we could sell, like, we could make it where we could raise some funds if we charged people for indulgences, and we got people to go, you got your loved one who's in purgatory right now, probably, and, and they want to get out of purgatory, and if you buy these indulgences, it's basically buying grace, and saying if you buy grace, you can apply that to whoever, you can have it credited to whoever's account you wanted, and that will release them from purgatory quicker, and they'll get to heaven. Again, do we see the the dysfunction in this, okay? Are you, are you tracking with me, all right? I know this is a lot of information. Um, this, this is obviously a, a, a massive problem. They actually had a jingle that went with it. This is horrible. They, they, as they were, they're, part of their salesmanship, their, their shtick for it, uh, as they were marketing this, this was mostly going on in Germany. Um, this is what they would say. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. So you got like, listen, you know, your loved one's trapped in purgatory, like they're going through it. You can get them out of there quicker. If you, as, as soon as the coin in the offering box clings, their soul springs and they get to heaven, like you're good to go. And so people were ponying up cash because they loved their loved ones and they were trying to take care of them and all this stuff. And people who were, people who understood the gospel, who were beginning to dive into the word of God, started going, this is not, the gospel. This is not the kingdom of God. This is, this is not the way that Jesus wants things to be. In all of this, what you have was this, like, this idea of works. It was all like, well, the monks can do more works for Jesus, and then the clergy can't. They don't do quite as many radical works as the monks, but they do more than the average person. The average person doesn't do many works for Jesus, and everything had to do with this, like, what are we doing for Jesus? And it was like working for our salvation, working for our grace, working for love and affection from God, working for all of these things. And the ground was absolutely set and ripe, for everything to be transformed completely. There was widespread agreement that the church desperately needed some kind of reform, but there was not a lot of agreement on what those reforms should look like. And that's where Martin Luther enters onto the scene. And Martin Luther is, you know, the most well-known name in the Reformation. He was not the only person. There were all kinds of, there were all kinds of, a lot of them were monks or scholars or clergy within that time who were sensing what was going on and going, something's not right and it needs to be changed and we need to change it from the inside out. And so Martin Luther was digging into God's word and read through a passage in Romans that talked about the righteous live by faith and he was frustrated because he felt like, I'm not righteous, I'm fully aware of my sin. And it was when the Holy Spirit illuminated his mind and helped him to see that the righteous living by faith doesn't mean that I'm righteous and able to live by faith because I do all kinds of right things, but that the righteousness that I have as a follower of Jesus is the righteousness of God that has been given to me by faith in Jesus Christ. It's not because of the good things that I do. It's because of the good things that Jesus has done that by faith are credited to my account. And this radically, it shook him to his core. And it was like this, in the middle of a culture going bonkers and just descending into not at all what the kingdom and not at all what the gospel is, it was like this wake-up call to the grace of Jesus Christ. And these men and women, these reformers, came to this place where they started to understand that salvation only comes by grace, and it comes through faith in Jesus Christ, and that's it. And they started banging on that drum. Um, in 1517, on October 31st of 1517, Martin Luther posted what was, what's known as the 95 Theses. He posted them um, on on a door, and it was 95 issues that he saw with the church that needed to be reformed, and it mostly revolved around indulgences, and it was this shot across the bow of the church saying, things have to change, this is not okay. The church started freaking out, the church leadership, they started pulling in Luther and other reformers, putting them on trial, engaging them in debates, um, telling them that they needed to recant what they were saying about Jesus, about the scriptures, about the church, and Luther would not recant. He would not, he would not back down. None of the reformers would. Some of them were actually killed by the church, um, uh, but they, they wouldn't back down from what they were saying. Luther ends up getting excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, and he famously burned the document when he got the letter saying that he was, ecum uh, he was, he was excommunicated. He burned the document saying like, okay, if you won't let me practice and worship the way that the Word of God says that we're supposed to practice and worship, I, we'll, 
we will faithfully follow Jesus in some way. We want to do it as a part of the church as a whole, but if we have to separate from what is right now, then we will do that because this is, this is what faithful looks like, faithfulness looks like in this season. And so they ended up pulling away, um, and, uh, and it was this massive movement of exodus and a new era in the church. Okay, here's, these are the two things that, that we need to get. That was a lot of setup. <laughs> Here's the two things that we need to get, okay, in all of this. The two main tenets of the Reformation, and again, I'm not, I'm not, clearly, I'm not a historical scholar. I, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can talk about within the Reformation. Um, there's two things that I want us to get out of this, okay? There are two aspects of this move of reform. The first one is what we'll call ordinariness, and the second one is the word, by ordinariness, one of the most massive moves of the reform was this idea that the average person, the laity, didn't matter, didn't count. That it would be like saying what I do because I, I have a vocational ministerial position, that's more important than what you do working at the mill or than what you do working at a bank or than what you do raising children. The, the Reformation pushed back against that hard, saying there is no distinction between what we choose to do with our vocation, what our ordinary life looks like, because there is not actually a division between ordinary and spiritual. There's not spiritual and unspiritual in our lives. You changing your child's diaper in the middle of the night can be every bit as much an act of worship is getting out your Bible and reading devotionally for that day. Do we know that? Stewarding our resources and caring for the things that we have, that's every bit as much a spiritual act as praying three times a day or fasting once a week. And with the Reformers came this idea that Everything is actually meant to be spiritual. And they honed in on scriptures like Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we're to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is our acceptable act of worship, that our lives are our worship before God. Eric touched on it this morning, talking about offering. And they honed in on Colossians uh, 3, 17. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. They honed in on this, that everything in life is actually spiritual. There is not greater spirituality in certain things and lesser spirituality in other things. It all has to do with our heart posture and our frame of mind as we do the things that we do. Do you hear that? What your heart posture and what your frame of mind is while you do the things you do matters more than the things you do. Again, unless the things you're doing are actual outright sin, then it doesn't matter what your heart posture is. They're not worship to God. That's the only, that's the only thing in our lives that is not meant to be sin, uh, is not meant to be worship. It's stuff that's apt, it's actually sin. That cannot be worship. Everything else is meant to be worship. And the reformers hammered this home. I remember as a kid when I realized that this was the case. It was, it, I was a teenager, and I was a skateboarder, and I was, I, I refer to myself now as I was skater trash. I dressed like, I dressed like a, I mean, I don't even, sometimes I'll bring a picture and show it. I mean, I wore pants that were 17 sizes too big, and they were hanging off of my rear end, and, you know, everything was huge, and I was all about skateboarding. That was all that it was, but I loved Jesus, and at some point, Colossians 3.17 hit home for me, and I realized that skateboarding could actually be an act of worship, that the way I engage in hobbies and interests could be an act of worship. I started realizing that the way that I used my, you know, the resources that I had as a kid, which was my parents' vehicle, that that could be an act of worship. I could use that to pick up kids to take them to church. I could use that to spend time with kids that didn't know Jesus. I could, like, it could become an act of worship if I saw it that way, right? This is, this comes from the Reformation. Um, I was just at a funeral yesterday, the funeral for, uh, for Ken Kakalka, and um, Ken helped plant this church, was in leadership of this church, Ken and Joy, and I was listening to everybody sharing stories about, he lived faithfully for Jesus, and I was listening to the stories that were being told about him yesterday, and it was like, yes, people talked about his love for the Word of God, 
Yes, they talked about his faithfulness as a part of CLF and all these things, but honestly, the main things that were being talked about were all of the ways that he lived his life in a Christ-centric way as he camped and hunted and fished, as he interacted with his children, as he taught them sports, as he spent time with friends in the outdoors, in the ways that he, he, um, he took seriously his work as a pipe fitter in the mill, and he wanted to do the best job possible and bring the greatest degree of excellence to his career. Those were things that spoke to people about the goodness of Jesus in his life. This is a concept that we get from the reformers. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 says that, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are royal priests. There is not a second, third tier. If you name the name of Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, you are now a part of the royal priesthood. And God has called you in your life, and he's gifted you in your life to do exactly what Peter said here, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God has called you and equipped you to do that. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter what your job description is. It doesn't matter what your neighborhood is. God's calling you and I to live in this kind of a way. And the second thing that, um, that, he, that the reformers hammered home was the word. It was getting back to the truth of God's word and learning to have our lives immersed in God's word. That God's word has to be the standard. It has to be the filter that everything is running through in our lives. That it's the lens that we look at all of life through. That we find our story caught up in the story of the word of God. That we find our story swept up into the story of Jesus. And the only way that we do that is by immersing ourselves in God's word. That's why in Joshua 1.8, we're told, keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Or Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9, it says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The reformers hammered home this idea that the word of God is for everyone. It's not for religious elites. It's for everyone. And so whether we're listening to the word of God through teaching that's being given to us, whether we're diving into the word of God for ourselves as we read it devotionally, that there is supposed to be this constant drip of the word of God in our lives. And I think a lot of times we, we, we think that the, the, where profound life change is going to happen is we're going to encounter God in this one scripture verse and it's going to like rock us and it's going to totally change us. And sometimes God does that. But many times we are just shaped and formed through this constant flow of truth from God's word. And we may not even remember in our minds. Our minds can only hold so much information. We may not even remember the truth that we are being taught, but our lives are being formed by that truth. And so the challenge from the reformers is to immerse ourselves in God's word, to get into God's word and let God's word get into us, to dive into it, to not just give it a cursory glance, to not only listen to someone else teach on it, but to read it for ourselves, to not only read it for ourselves, but to listen to others teach on it. This steady drip, this constant truth saturating our lives. That is the goal of what uh, God wants for us through his word. And then we don't just immerse ourselves in it, but we have to do what it says. In James, yeah, it's not enough for us to just know and to go, yeah, God's story is my story. This is my spiritual heritage, but how does that change our lives? How do we behave differently? We talk all the time. The the word of God is important to us. We, We need to know it. We need to do it and we need to share it. And if we're only doing one of those three or two of those three, we're missing what our call is as the people of God. We're called to know it and understand it and find ourselves and find our place and find God through, through his word. 
We're called to obey it and to do it. James says in James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So we know it, we do it, and then we share it. We give it away to other people. We don't just hold it for ourselves. We don't hold on to the words of truth and the words of life for ourselves, but we give it away to other people. And they might actually want to hear what we have to say if we're obeying it, if we're doing it, right? This is, this is the legacy of the Reformers. This is what we learn from the Reformers. So here's what I want us to do. I'm going to uh, ask you to stand up to your feet right now, and we're going we're gonna to close in prayer. I have, a, I have a challenge for you for this week, for you to immerse yourselves in the Word of God. Uh, the challenge is, I think, do we have that next slide? You want to throw that up there? The challenge is those verses that we just read. I would encourage you, if you need to pull your phone out and snap a picture of those right now so that you remember them, um, I would encourage you to read and meditate on these verses in the coming weeks. I would encourage you to memorize these verses. These are verses talking about just what we said, the, the ordinariness of the spiritual life, that ordinary life is deeply spiritual. It's meant to be that way. Memorize those verses that speak that truth so that you hide it deep down inside your heart. And then memorize the verses, meditate on the verses that talk about the importance of the Word of God in our everyday life, to know it and to understand it and to do it, to be obedient to the Word of God. Those are great places for us to start. If you're like, well, I don't really know where to start, that's, that's the place for you to start. Let's, let's be people who lean into this fact that you have a divine call on your life to advance the kingdom of God in your ordinary, everyday life. And you have power to do that by the grace of Jesus Christ, and one of the ways that he gives us grace, he imparts a grace and power to us, is through the power of his word, the truth of his word. And so we have to feast on that word for nourishment to be able to do the task that God is calling us to. So um, let's, uh, let's close our eyes to pray. And I'm going to ask you if you're comfortable, you know, our, our, our postures matter. So if you're comfortable with it, if you'd open up your hands um, that's just symbolic of saying, I'm not holding anything back from you, God. You can, you can have it all, and, and I'm willing to receive whatever it is that you want to give to me. And, um, let's, let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful that there's not hierarchy in your kingdom. God, we're grateful that we don't have to earn our way to you, that we're not dependent on anyone mediating our relationship with you, Jesus is the only mediator that we need. We confess that right now. We receive that right now. Jesus, we thank you that it's by grace received from you that we have a firm foundation to stand on, that we can find freedom and forgiveness. It's not because of earning God, I ask that you would fill us with that deep and profound truth. And God, out of that truth of our forgiveness, of our belovedness, out of that truth of the grace that we've received from you, Lord, that we would be empowered to do good works that you've prepared in advance for us to do. God, shake us to our core with the idea that you desire to move through us. Shake us to our core with a hunger for your truth, for your word. God, I pray that you would stir it up in us, whether we've been serving you for 50 years or more, or whether we're young in our faith, God, whether we have gray hair or whether we still haven't hit puberty yet. God, stir up in the generations of this church a hunger and a thirst for your word. God, make us hungry for your truth. Speak to us, we pray, Jesus. Mark us for your kingdom purposes, we pray. Use us in whatever way you see fit. Be glorified by every part of our life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Love you guys. Thanks for hanging with me this morning. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you back here next week.